Hey, what's up? Matt here, and on today's episode, we've got Ridge Deveni. You know, Rich's done a few things in his life, but I'll let him kind of go into that. I actually met Rich for business purposes. I was introduced by a friend of mine from the military, Alex. Yeah. And then from there, we ended up hiring Rich to go through some of the attribute assessments and sort of figure out, because we were always reactively hiring, and that created some issues. And then we brought Rich in to help us sort of fix some of those issues of not stop us from reactively hiring, but being able to reactively hire and have more positive outcomes. Yeah, hire the right people, right? Exactly. Yeah. So tell us, how did you become... The attributes guy. The current Rich Tavini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, as you know, I mean, we were both military men. I went into the Navy in 1996. Yeah. Immediately went from getting commissioned in the Navy to SEAL training. So I went to Navy SEAL training in 1996. Yeah. Made it through. That was the first of the easy ones. That's what I'm told by everybody before me. Yeah. I subsequently tell that to people after. Mine was the last hard one. Exactly. So went to Hawaii as my first duty station yeah. until about 2001. Then went to the East Coast. And of course, the war broke out. It became very busy. In 05, I went to one of our really specialized SEAL command. And this is a command where you have to do a very specialized selection. So SEAL training, as you know, on its own, BUDS, basic underwater demolition, that's a 90% attrition rate, right? Yeah. For this specialized command, it's you have to have been a SEAL for at least five years. You have to have stellar recommendations. You have to yep. do interviews, all that stuff. And then you go through a nine-month selection yep. training process. 50% make it. Right? When so. did they teach you how to write a book? <laughs> yeah, college. That was yeah, when I. Yeah. yeah. So, but even then, I didn't know how to write a book. I, yeah. I, I learned when I did it. I was there. Yeah. So, although, yeah, the the now nowadays you'd think it was a it was yeah, part of the seal yeah, training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a prerequisite. So. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to say mine's not a seal book, though, right? So, okay. as you know, um, but uh, but yeah. So at the specialized command, I served there. At, but in 2010, I was I was put in charge of the assessment selection. And one of the things they had had asked me to do was, hey, can you help us articulate what we're doing here? Um, because they weren't, uh, we weren't effectively describing why guys weren't making it through. So, okay, guy this goes, is for the specialized unit. This is for the specialized unit. Yeah. So, guys, guys shall through. remain nameless. And we, yeah, shall remain nameless, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, but a guy, a guy would drop out, and we'd say, well, he couldn't shoot very well. And you tell a seal who's been a seal for that long that they can't shoot very well. I can shoot yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> I could. This is a guy who shoots, shoot, probably shot more rounds in the military than most in the military, right? So, yeah. So they said, hey, can you help us figure out what's going on? This is when I really began to separate performance into these, this idea of skills. And attributes and the difference between the two, yeah. and so so that I so I did that at the commands. Retired in 2017, began working in the leadership space uh, and and the the high performing team space, and realized that uh, a lot of businesses and organizations were having trouble articulating performance to the okay. extent that they couldn't yeah. hire the right people. And so so ultimately, I decided to write a book. Ultimately, the idea is there's a difference between between attributes and skills, and okay. and and skills are these things that are are uh, not inherent to our nature. We learn them, okay? Um, we're not born with the ability to ride a bike or throw a ball. Yep. Uh, they direct our behavior in known and specific environments to tell us when and how to ride a bike or throw a ball. Um, and then they are visible, so they're very easy to assess, measure, and test, okay? okay. What skills don't tell us is how we're going to show up in stress, challenge, and uncertainty. And this is where attributes come in. Attributes are inherent to our nature. In other words, all of us are born with levels of adaptability, yep. situation awareness, uh, resilience. Um, attributes don't direct our behavior; they inform our behavior. So they tell us. Can you can you go into that? What does that mean? That so I, so for example, my son's levels of resilience and perseverance uh, informed the way he showed up when he was learning the skill of riding a bike, and he was falling off a dozen times doing so. Right. So, okay. So so they inform how we're going to show up to a situation, and then because they're hard to see, they're hard to measure. How do you how do you assess or measure someone's levels of adaptability or perseverance? Right. So. But the idea is if you are if you are going to build a team yeah. that can actually be a high performing team and and the definition of a high performing team as opposed to just a team a team is any group of two or more people working together towards a common goal, goal or objective that's okay. a team okay a high performing team is any group of two or more people that's working towards a common goal or objective that perform not only when things are going great but also when things aren't going great mm -hmm. right that's what that's what the designating factor is for any high performing team they perform when things don't go as planned, and they keep on performing in chaos and complexity. If you want a team like that, you have to look at attributes because attributes are what define our performance in those times. And so, uh, so I wrote the book on it. You know, I wrote about twenty-five attributes in the book. Um, have subsequently been doing work with businesses and organizations. The list has grown to forty-two attributes. Um, and like we did with you all, we come in, we help an organization understand 
what their attribute list looks like for their particular organization, because every team and organization will have their own. Yeah. Uh, the attribute list to make up a great SEAL team looks different than attribute list to make up a great sales team or a surgical team, right? So first we determine what that looks like, then we apply that to all of their roles and positions, and then we help them understand how to hire specifically for those attributes, because looking for attributes is going to be different than looking for skills, and so we help them do that as well. Mm, absolutely. I think sports are a great analogy, right? Yeah. So, like, to sort of take it away from the military, but... You know, like an all-star team. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, they're truly terrible. The, the, the dream team where you pick all the right, uh, yeah, all the all the top people, and yeah, it doesn't work that way because yeah. those are not team players. Here's a great uh, uh, story. I, so when I was doing the initial work, I found this guy. I was researching, researching. I found this guy named Russell Akoff. Russell Akoff. He had a, he had a couple weird titles, right? He is a systems theorist. He was a management science expert and. A, a couple other things, but he used to relate management and leadership to uh, to systems theory. And one of the things he used to say is that, hey, hey, if you took, if we took the best parts of every best automobile on the planet, right? So, you know, I don't want to insult anybody. I'm not really a car guy, but imagine, you know, if you disagree with me, okay. But the far Ferrari has the best engine. The Land Rover has the best suspension. The the uh, the, the um, even just saying it, it sounds terrible. Yeah, the Lamborghini has the best car, uh, carburetor, whatever. Take all the best parts of every best vehicle and put them all together. Would you have the best vehicle on the planet? And the answer is no, because the parts wouldn't fit together. And so he used to say a, this, a system is never just the sum of its parts. It's a product of their interaction. And the same thing goes with a team. A team is never just the sum of its parts. It's a product of how they interact. So you can put together a dream team of all the best parts. If they don't interact, they're going to be a poor team. Have you heard uh, Elon Musk talk about when they made the first Tesla? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think so, yeah. So they tried to adapt a Lotus Elise, or like a Lotus Elan, I can't remember yeah. which one. Uh, and they were like, that's the platform that we're going to use to build these electric cars. And they outsourced to, a, I think it was a company called like AC Electric or something like that. They outsourced some of the stuff to that, and then they were going to put them all together, and that was going to be the platform of how they create kind of a scalable and replicatable um, you know, model. But like, turns out the AC Electric thing didn't really work that well, and the platform, the Lotus... Uh, the moment you added batteries to it, it fucking collapsed, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what they ended up, it ended up uh, by the end of it uh, sharing 7% with any other vehicle. So it was basically, it was a, it was a 93% completely bespoke vehicle with yeah, 7% yeah. shared parts with any other vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> like th they basically realized that like in order to create this high performance, because that's when they were creating like the Roadster, right? Right, right. right. It's super high performance, brand new thing. They they had to just create everything because everything had to work together. Work together, right? yeah. And so and that's a key. You know, they they couldn't take a, a sports car and make it into a better sports car just by adding you know new sports car things. It just didn't work. That yeah, way. yeah. And that's yeah. and same thing goes with people. Yeah. Teams, they ha it's all about how they interact. Yeah. So like like if we if we sort of take it back to like the like the SEAL teams, I, I think like one of my if I wasn't sort of informed, I'd be like, well, like why does that like surely the training and the skills matters. Surely, like matters, you know, you know what I mean. So like, 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 why? Yeah. If you have a guy who's really good and he's trying to get into this, you know, specialized unit, etc., and he's really good, like, why wouldn't you just take them? Like, like, what was that thing that you couldn't quite describe? Yeah. And yeah. why was that actually more important? Because I'm assuming you probably took some people who were technically less proficient. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, because we well. So here's a couple examples, uh, and 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 honestly, the inception of the SEAL teams as and every every spec ops unit has its own uh, origin story. But but the idea of special operations, the SEALs included, is that you are a unit that is designed to go into environments of deep complexity. Yeah. Right, you're not going to be able to predict what's going on. You're often you're often well, maybe not in today's military, but but but. Most of history, the spec ops unit was undergunned, undermanned, um, out on their own, and their whole thing was to go frustrate, sabotage the enemy and not get caught, right? And force multiplier. Yeah, and be able to react to situations and environments, right? So, so those types of those types of reactions. Like in the days of two that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or no even NVGs. Yeah, yeah, the starlights yeah. go up or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but the idea is that the the ability to do that um, is an attributes based ability. It's the adaptability. It's resilience right. and things like that. And so so when the seal when seal training I mean started in the forties by Draper Kaufman, he started seal training the, their very first one with a week long evolution. And basically, he started the class. And he'd start this class in the week on a Sunday, and they'd run the whole week, and they'd sleep maybe two hours for that whole week, and they'd do simulations and combat simulations and do exercises, and they just exhausted, right, the whole week. And he didn't run any examination, examinations or evaluations in that week. It was not, there was nothing testing the, 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 the guys uh, in terms of mental acuity or things like that. Things like that. 
it was all whether or not the guy stayed or quit, right? Um, and lots of guys quit. Almost 90% did. And that has translated into, into modern-day SEAL training. And so modern-day SEAL training, you spend hundreds of hours running around with big, heavy boats on your head, um, hundreds of hours exercising with 300-pound telephone poles and freezing in the surf zone. Well, when I started this work in 2010, okay, I had already been on hundreds of combat missions overseas, and I can tell you with certainty, never on one did, did I carry, carry a heavy boat, boat yeah. like <laughs> yeah. or a 300-pound telephone pole. So, yeah. so w- what they were doing to us was not training us in the skills to be SEALs. They were teasing out these qualities, these attributes, to see if we had what it took to do the job, right? And then the last story I'll tell you, because this is really, it, it was told to me, and I, I remembered it when I was doing this work, but the story goes... Um, and this apparently happened way before I went to the SEAL teams. The story goes, this kid showed up to SEAL training one day, and he walks into the instructor's office and says, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And the instructor says, okay, fine, but you have to do a swim test. And the kid's like, okay. So they take him out of the pool. Easy swim test, 50 meters, 25 meters to one end, 25 meters back to the other. And uh, the kid gets all ready, and he jumps in the pool. And when he jumps in the pool, he sinks right to the bottom of the pool. And he starts walking across the bottom of the pool to one end, and he touches that, and he walks across the bottom of the pool back to the other end. And he comes up, and he's gasping for air, nearly drowning. And the instructor looks at him and says, what the hell are you doing? And the kid, who's trying to catch his breath, says, I'm sorry, instructor, I don't know how to swim. And at that point, the instructor pauses, and he looks at the kid and says, that's okay, we can teach you how to swim. Right? And why did he say that? He said that because if that kid had the attributes, the qualities to show up to Navy SEAL training no, without knowing how to swim, <laughs> yes. he had he got balls on you, brother. He got everything inside of him to be a Navy SEAL. Teaching yeah. him to swim was going to be easy. And so the idea yeah. is if you have the attributes buttress every level of our performance, every skill we have is buttressed by these attributes. So the elemental forms of ele- the, the elemental uh, things of performance, uh, standards of performance that we fall back to. And so if we understand which attributes we have and what attributes we're looking for, we're literally talking about ge- generating teams of people that we know exactly what they're going to do. And we can, in fact, see dark horses. You know, we can spot the dark horses early on. The people who may not look like they have the skills, but they have all the attributes they need, and training them in the stuff that we need to train them is going to be a snap, and we're going to have rock stars. Have, have you looked into, like, I guess, the, like, the psyche of the person who does quit? Do you guys ever do like? Yeah. Um, well, so so but it's always fascinating to me because yeah. I never, I never understood it. Yeah. Be- yeah. Because like I remember we were sitting there and they we were on selection. They did a workout and they said this workout doesn't stop until somebody quits. Yeah. And if you voluntarily quit, you can never reapply. Right. I don't know, but just like, yeah. The same thing. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta you know ring the bell essentially. We don't have a bell. You just go. I'm pussy. Right. You yeah. walk away. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> type thing. And I remember we were sitting there and we're like two hours into a yeah. pretty raucous workout. Um, and dudes are pissing themselves, shitting themselves, throwing up. One guy did all three at once. It was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. <laughs> right? And I remember this guy gets up and sort of rings the bell, and they go, sweet, it's over. And I was like, I could never imagine. It's not because I'm a particularly hard-headed or tough person, but I, my brain always goes, this is such a short period of time in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Like, why would I give up? It's only 10 minutes away, 20 minutes away. Mm-hmm. All i got to do is not be the last one. Right. Right. They began, after I, after I went through Buzz, this is probably early 2000s, they began to do exit interviews with guys who quit. Um, and now I am not certain that they were able to determine what, those, yeah. what, the, what the list of things is. They're still looking at it. But in the work I've done, I have, I have recognized that I could, there, are, there is at least one or two, but specifically one attribute that you absolutely must have to make it through SEAL training or the spec ops training you've been through, and that is compartmentalization. And so what you were doing in that workout is, in fact, you were basically in that workout, and you did not ever consider the big picture. You, 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 you deliberately ignored the big picture. In other words, how long is this going to go on? What you did was you focused on small incremental elements. I'm just going to go to the next exercise. So that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Totally, because, it's, because that's exactly what you do to not quit. Those Gosh. people who quit, those people who quit, they are unable to compartmentalize the levels that we are, right? Uh, because in, in, um, in deep duress, what will happen is they'll just, they just, even though they might start doing it, they just, they can't get over how long it's been or how long it's going to be. So a, a very common um, comment uh, or theme of guys who quit is... Um, we were we were doing that. We had, we had, we had done this. We had been carrying boats all morning. We were in a car- boat carrying, and then they said we're going to be carrying boats all afternoon or all night. And I just couldn't imagine carrying boats anymore. Then they quit, right? 
none of us who made it through ever thought about anything past a minute or two. And we were, we were constantly compartmentalizing. We, I call it moving horizons. We were, we were picking horizons and moving to them constantly so that we just stepped through it. We never yeah. took in the big picture. This is exactly what you and I and our compadres did in combat. Combat requires massive mm-hmm. compartmentalization because if you're in a combat environment and, and, the, and the shit's hitting the fan and everything's chaos, if you take in the big picture... Even guys like us will wilt, right? Because it's just too much. It's too overwhelming. But we don't do that. We've trained. First of all, we come to, we show up to the beaches of Budge or the beaches of, of your training, and we have some in us, and then it's just hyper-developed. You know? So we come to the table with compartmentalization, and we hyper-develop it. That's one of the key factors. There's probably a couple other in there that I, haven't, I, I need to think through, but if there's one distinguishing one, that's it. Yeah, I remember I used to, uh, I used to go, you know what? At the top of the hill, I'll reevaluate this, yeah. and I will see if this is something I want to keep doing. <laughs> Yes, that's that, that's yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I go to yeah. top of a hill and I go, that wasn't too bad. Yeah, and I go, let me just go to the next one. Yeah. I did the same thing when I ice plunge. Yeah, go, me too. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to three minutes and three minutes. Let's see how I yeah. feel. And then I go three minutes. I go. Oh, that's not that bad. So ice plunge. Let's just stop there because ice plunge, ice baths are are actually a really good way to practice this idea yeah. of moving horizons. And, and that's I, why I do it for my son. You did, I did it for my son and my wife, right? Yeah. So they. So when I, when my son and my wife first got in it, I said, okay, when you get in this thing, the first thing I want you to as soon as you get in, I want you to stare at my hand and count to twenty. Right? They did that. Count to 20. As soon as that 20 was over, pick another point, pick a number. Boom. Pick a number, counted that. Okay, pick another point, pick a number. Do that. They each got to, in the first try, a minute. Or, no, two minutes. They got to yeah, two yeah. Minutes. It's great. Because they're compartmentalizing. So, so, this is, so this process, and I'm writing about it in this next book, right? This process is called moving the horizon. Right? Okay. And what we're doing is we're basically, we're, we're choosing horizons that are subjective to our experience, that are meaningful enough that they okay. stretch the boundaries, but they're not too easy, right? Um, but the, the, the length of those horizons, the distance, is usually, is usually uh, relative to the intensity of the experience, right? So, so if it's a very intense experience, free, freezing in the surf zone, for example, I might be like, I'm going to count to 10, right? Or, like, I was, I'd be like, you know, I'd sometimes be doing, they'd be just, we'd be, be doing push-ups. It's like, well, there's only so many push-ups I can do. And yeah, exactly. Once, <laughs> I'm done, I, once I'm done, they'll maybe hit the surf or they'll do something else. But, yeah. You know, but th- that was my horizon. I remember being, running with the boat on my head at night. You know, there's a sand berm. I was like, well, I'm just going to focus until we get to the end of the berm, right? Yeah. And what happens there is actually really interesting. And my buddy, Huberman, you know, um, he, he, we, we talk about this idea in, in neuroscience where if you, if you set yourself a horizon, what's happening is you're, you, the brain is, in fact, um, f- the brain figures out the world and makes sense of the world through three factors. Uh, they're, called, they're, they're basically three factors are duration, pathway, outcome. Okay? Duration, how long is this going to last? Pathway, what's my route out? And outcome, what's the final result? If we are in absence of one or more of those, we begin to feel anxious and uncertain. Okay? So, so if you have... So you just create your so, own. So, so, yeah, so if you have one, then you're kind of, if you're, if you're absent one, you're mildly anxious. Absent two, you're medium anxious. Absent three, you're like, that's when. All we do, all Moving Horizons do, does is you create your own DPO. So we call it DPOs, right? I create my own dura- duration pathway outcome. I'm, I'm running along the berm, right? And I say, okay, I'm, not ju- I'm just going to, I'm just going to make it the next, this next, the end of this berm. Okay, I've just created duration till I get to end of berm. Pathway to the end of berm, outcome, end of berm. Here's what happens, though. As soon as you hit that wicket, you get a dopamine reward. You've just given yourself a dopamine reward, right? The dopamine reward allows you, if you're, if you're doing it, to do it again. Yeah. To pick a new horizon. And so what we've done, what we did unconsciously when we first got to training and just hyper-developed, we were just constantly moving horizons, creating DPOs. We were giving ourselves dopamine rewards in small bursts all the way through that training. Um, and some people can't. But everybody can practice this concept of moving horizons because it's the secret to getting through any uncertainty. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating because that's exactly... Okay, that's really interesting. I think one of the other things is uh, I've got two things on that, and I don't want to forget. One is what are the downsides of that mm-hmm. right? scale? Yes. Right? So I would say downsides to hyper compartmentalize. Any attribute in extremes is a bad thing, yeah. right? Um, so downsides to compartmentalization are probably obvious. You, uh, you block out the world to the extent you block out emotions to the extent that you the things build up. Emotional compartmentalization is probably the worst. Okay. Um, and you and I know this. We've talked about this in, in, our, in our private conversation where, where if you experience something that's very tragic you know, or, or hard emotionally, you cannot react to it in the moment, right? When you're in comp- you, you, have to, you have to finish the job. But if you don't it's understand, come back at some stage. if you don't understand, I know I did this. I think you had mentioned you do this too. There were times when I'd experienced something really horrible, right? But I had to, I had to put it away. I had to compartmentalize. Once the, everything was done, mission, mission oh, we were back. The, all the briefings were in, and I was able to get by myself. I would deliberately call that back out, and I'd mourn it, you know, because I needed to get it out. Because if you compartmentalize too much, it's going to all, it's going to all come, it's going to 
burst out somewhere. Yeah. And we all know, and I mean, both of us are married. We have very happy, happy marriages. You can't be in a relationship if you are hyper compartmentalizing everything. Okay. It just can't happen. So, so you just have to be real careful. And like, how would you identify that in like an employee or like a business partner or someone who's, you know, taking something that can be a positive attribute and potentially through stress, yeah. right? Because I'm mean, like, so stress is an exacerbator, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, you know, like, like, I guess, how can you see? Okay, so the symptoms so, of someone over- so over compartmentalizing in the business, the professional realm, and some people are just like this. So my wife, she, she's, she's guilty of this. She's a self-admitted um, uh, over compartmentalizer, um, as is Huberman. Actually, he's self-admitted. And what happens is the way this manifests is, is someone who they get locked into something, okay, and everything else in the world falls away. Right, the, the the world could be burning down, and they won't notice it. They're just they're so, and it's very hard for them to pull back out. Right, so so now no, this, hi, like hyper focus like is that hyper, is that during times or like specific it, it, times it be, or yeah. does it? It could be specific. I mean, it could be. I mean, depending on the person, it could be. It could be several hours. It could be several days. Okay. Right, um, but you're just so into this. Nothing else is pulling you out, and everything else falls away. That's hyper compartmentalization in a in a professional sense, where it just gets to it's not it's not balanced with task switching, which is the opposite. Task switching is the ability to pull out, shift, and focus on something. And so else. the extreme of that is like inability to sort of finish and just go bop 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 bop. That's bop, a, almost ADHD, you know, in terms of the, the, the you're just you you cannot focus on anything. It's just you're bouncing everywhere. That's, have you, that's have you sort of looked in because I have I have ADHD. I was diagnosed as a kid. Yeah. And, um, like, the medication changed my life like, yeah, yeah. significantly. Yeah. Real, real positive for me. And then it's funny because when I went into the military, I wasn't allowed to take the medication anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I went, came back on it about a year ago. And I actually saw, like, because, like, um, stressors exacerbate things. Yes. As the business gets bigger and I get more responsibility, right. there's more consistent stressors on me. Yeah. And so I, I, was ex- I was displaying some of the behaviors that I had when I was a kid. Yes. Um, that, I, that I didn't realize um, and my mom was like, this is exactly what you were wow, like before yeah, you were yeah. medicated. And yeah. I was like, what do you mean? Because I'd forgotten like, that I even sort of had it, yeah, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. And then, like, but the stress, the load of the amount of information I was intaking, because yeah. with ADHD, like, you do that hyper-focus thing, but, it, but you're sort of like you're, you're intaking putting, yeah. tons of information all the time. Right. And so when you get home, you're melted. Yes. Like you are incapable of having a conversation because your brain is mush. Yeah, yeah. And it also makes you really hyper uh, really hypersensitive to criticism. Yeah. Of which I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, so yeah, but yeah. the the sort of like, you know, um I, I sort of look at like an allergy, right? Like, yeah. you know, like histamine levels build up and you don't feel it. And That's then right. the moment there's anything over amount, then it's all the symptoms, yeah. right? And so I was like, This is weird. And then, you know, I was like, Oh shit, there's a few things here. My my mom was like, dude, this is yeah. This is what you were like beforehand. I was like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay, so I went and got medicated again a while ago, figured it all out, the yeah. medication stuff, and it made a big difference. But have you had a look at kind of like, because sales reps in particular are yeah. high levels of ADHD. Yeah. Because I think like it's a very dopamine, like the, dopamine hunting is a very sure. common trait for people with like ADHD and ADD. Yeah. Right? And so sales is like literally dopamine hunting. Like yeah. you are hunting yeah, for yeah, sales. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Commission yeah. on these sales, like the rush you get from like hunting it and getting and it is very it, similar. Yeah. So you get a very high level of people that have it. Have you had explored kind of how that sort of neurodivergent is, yeah. the, is the new word of saying kind of affects some of those? So only only ideas. tangentially. So I'll just I'll will speak as a complete layman here. Um, I think I think one of our interests as we as we continue to build and grow is to is to actually sit down and, and get with some people who could actually help us really study in more depth. But I think the uh, but but I think the ADHD thing is is a couple things. It's not just task switching. It's also hyper vigilance. It's, it's a lot of situation awareness. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on now. You also balance that with high compartmentalization, which is interesting because that's why you got through the training. But I think what happens is you're probably higher on task switching than you are on compartmentalization, which overwhelms. You're also high on situation awareness. So I think what ha- I think I think I think in terms of by the way, we know this because I've done the assessment. <laughs> That's right. Yes, right? you have. Yeah. On the attributes.com, oh, isn't it? And the, uh, the attributes, yeah, the attributes.com. Yeah, right. so you can take an assessment. And see we'll put the link in the description. You can go and yeah. take the assessment. But uh, the idea is, um, I think that what's going on is, uh, and, and I would say, like, like when, you, when, I've, when I've had a side conversation, is the, the, the detrimental ADHD, the full-blown, maybe even, even, even more so than you, mm-hmm. is, is, a, uh, is a mind that is taking in so many inputs and right, can't turn it off. It's almost like Clark Kent as a kid, right? Mm-hmm. And, and just everything's coming in, and the, and the focus just can't, it's just, it's just hopping from everywhere. And, so, and, and then also low compartmentalization. Yeah. So but it also takes, and you take, they have elements of hyper-focus. 
Right. Yeah. There. So, yeah. So, so yeah, well. So. So. So one of the. And I don't. I, I only know. I'm, I have layman's knowledge of this. But what I. What I. The, what I've heard is that the solution is to help. Is to help a mind kind of track in on something for a little bit, and then track in something else, but slow down that process, right? So it's yeah. not hopping, right? So. Um, so I think. I think now most of us. You know, most of us have a fairly normal levels of these things and we can start seeing how, how it manifests in our normal lives mm-hmm. i think I, I think military folks like those of us who are in the professions we were in required a high level and a balance of all of them and i think so let me ask you this when you were in the military and you weren't medicated did you see did, did it did it affect you so i think like the an- i think the answer is like uh because of adhd i yeah. think i was able to get a lot of energy yeah. because and i like um like it's it's kind of a weird affliction because everyone have, has elements of it, which yeah, is one of the annoying yeah. parts of it because everyone's like, oh yeah, I have that too. It's yeah. like yeah, but it's not a hundred percent right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, for example, like if I'm gonna look for something under a bed, I'll look six times. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because I go huh. Huh? <laughs> like it's yeah. nonstop, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, like, like reading, I, I can like I can read very proficiently. Yeah. And if you flash words on a screen. I can read at an enormously high rate with high levels of comprehension. Yeah. But if you put all the words together in a page, it is borderline impossible for me to read. Yeah, so there's I a lot of input. Yeah. I don't intake any of it, and I have to read the page over and over and over again because I go, eh, like, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Eh, like that. Yeah. Whereas they do a test where they flash words, and it was like 600 words a minute. Wow. Brrr, and I could read the whole thing. It was fine because I see it. Yeah. As sort of a whole, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's very interesting. And that's like, but the pattern, re- but it makes you get a pattern recognition. And that was in some ways fulfilled by what you were doing in the military. Yeah. Yeah, which I see. I mean, I, I think, I think the, the profession we were in fulfills that. Like, we were, again, we were talking offline here about this idea that, that guys like us come back from combat and we don't, some of us have PZ, PTSD, but a lot of us have LTSD. We have lack of traumatic stress syndrome, right? Yeah. Because we get, we're in this environment where we have so much input and there's so much adrenaline. We're on this, we're kicking doors. We're just, every night we're going out. And we're opping. We have people shooting at it, things like that, and it's just so exciting, and it's 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 stimulating all of our senses, yeah. and and it, and and we're putting all of those stimulations to a very precise use, right? Yeah. Um, and and the whole can, when you go into combat, like your whole vision spectrum changes, totally. yeah, your smell changes, yeah. like everything have, flows. But, but there's a it's use, very interesting. There's a yeah. use for all of that, right? Yeah. You're you're putting all of these sensory inputs to a very precise use. And part of it is because there's a survival mechanism. So your body's like, hey, you must do this or you may die. Yeah. Um, you come back into a non-threatening world, right? And, and suddenly you're either, either life is just really boring or you're, most of the time you're so hypervigilant and you can't turn it off, right? I remember, yeah. and I'm not, I, I'm not on the spectrum at all, but or I, don't, I, I wouldn't think I was, but I'd come home from, from uh, uh, a combat zone and I'd be walking in New York City, for example, oh, yeah. and, and I'd, just like, I'd be like, okay, I have to, I deliberately have to say, okay, the guy who's walking three feet behind me, I, I have to deliberately not worry about that, right? Yeah. Because you're just everything, it's just, choo, 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 and you, it's just, you're not in the same world. So, so I, think, I think environment... Uh, uh, is, is a part of this, and I think yeah. probably um, your levels were probably satiated when you're in the military to a, to a degree yeah. because of the job, uh, and then you got out, and then, of course, then you started experiencing it in different ways. But I think it's fascinating. But that's, I mean, again, it'd be really interesting to, to talk to some psychs about this who understand, and, and maybe give them some of this data and say, hey, what is, how does this relate? You know? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because like I, I've, I've seen a psych. We talked about that before, but she was, you know, she was like, a lot of these things will sort of sort themselves out if you just get medicated. Because she's like, it's the one thing that you can't treat through. Therapy, right? Like you right. have to medicate for some of these symptoms. Yeah, yeah. And the most re- the re- main reason why most people who have ADD or ADHD are kind of in a shit spot is because they're called lazy, mm. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. so like they're called lazy, but it's like a physical incapability of being able to do certain things yeah. that most people find very frustrating. Like me and my wife have talked about it. She's like, there are certain things which I'm incapable of doing. Yeah. Like it's very frustrating. Uh, I'm fully aware of it. Yeah. It's very yeah, annoying. Yeah. Yeah. But if you tell me you must bring this home, there is fucking zero chance I bring that home. <laughs> really? Yeah. Absolutely zero. Yeah. And I can focus on it, yeah, and yeah. I can be like, I'm going to bring it home. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah. bring it home. There's no fucking way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I forgot my homework every single day for school. Wow. Every day I forgot my homework. Yeah. And, you know, like that causes you to be like, well, it's like, no, I did it. Right, right. You know, yeah. and then the teachers don't believe you. Yeah, yeah. And you get called, you know, you're just lazy, you're lying, yeah, like that, yeah. so you're going to get called that. And then, your parents are like, just remember it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, if that happens to my kid, I'll go, oh. I know exactly, yeah. Have, he's, you seen, have you seen any signs? Or, little or, bits and pieces, yeah, yeah. but um, I don't think so. Yeah, that's good. Um, but like, I would go, oh, he's incapable. Yeah. Or she's incapable. 
Like, so you have to facilitate yes. around it. That's right. You can't, yeah. like, the dude has, if you have a broken leg, you can't walk upstairs. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, you know what I mean? So, so like, let me ask you this, because, because, because when we talk about sales folks, right? Um, I want to ask That's you. why they don't do the red. Well, but, but so let's talk about in your, as, if you can dissect your sales process and kind of that, that reward system, what are, what are you actualizing in terms of those attributes when you're in the sales process that's, that, that is, is in some ways satiating that? Yeah. Because if, if, if a lot of people have it, let's give them some ideas on how to start naming it because if they can name what's going on, then they can start metabolizing yeah, it. Yeah, that's so, why when I learned yeah. NEPQ, it was a system. I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, because I never had a system before that. Yeah, I had yeah. a way that I thought, but I didn't have a way of bringing everything together. Yeah, right. That's why I love shooting because shooting is like anyone can be an amazing shot. Yeah, yeah. It just you just follow the. You just follow. have to do the steps, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like when my friend, got, <laughs> my first friend that got shot, right? <laughs> he came back from overseas, and I go, mate, run, down, crawl, observe, aim, fire. Which one did you do? Right? Because yeah, you yeah. can't get shot if you do that. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, like, yeah. That's, the that's the system. That's the system, right? Yeah. Um, do a center appeal in the desert. So what's right? interesting is that what, so what's happening there literally is a system. So there's a couple of things. The system is creating steps that yeah. you can basically DPO through. It's creating. Exactly. It's giving yeah. you your horizons to move through. Yeah. And when you have horizons, you you're 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 stepping through. So so part of this it's, you're cool ticking about, mental boxes. That's right. And what's what's cool about the work we both do, right? Attributes allows you to name it, right? And by, yeah. by naming it, it just gives you it gives you so much information. So so it gives you so much um, space from which you can actually start working with the problem. Because now I have a now I have some some words that I can describe what's going on. Yeah. And then a system allows you to begin basically creating. You know, giving you those horizons, giving you those DPS. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll give you like, so th- these are the things that sales reps do wrong. Yeah. Um, so the the first thing is that they're very focused on the next thing they have to do. Mm-hmm. So they don't listen to the prospect yeah, in yeah, real time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's the biggest thing. I can usually watch a call and go, I can hear their monologue. Like I can hear their internal monologue. That's a big thing because then you miss all of the important things that are being said. Things that are being said yeah. because like most sales at a very high level, you don't actually have to ask many questions. It's just a series of probes and clarifies. Right, right. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And you'd be like, yeah, I really love more sales. More? Yeah. And then they go deeper and deeper, right? Yeah, so you end up, yeah. you know, because like whatever I say, to, it's 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 sullied with the context of being a sales rep. Yeah. Whatever they say is their words, right? right? And so most sales reps, like they are not able to pick up on that mm-hmm. because they are very concerned about the next thing they're, they're going to say, say. Yeah, yeah. right? And so, um, so that like that like that's a really big one, yeah. and a, a lot of the reason why they. They are that way, besides, like, if you take out the fact that they should have just, like, memorized certain things, and gone, is that they, they are, like, simultaneously focused on the next step, but not understanding or focusing on how what they're doing now yeah. is a greater part of a whole. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so they're focusing on the, they, they end up with, like, a, a very segmented series of, like sort of like the car that's yeah. built from the best things instead of the best car right because because you're not you're not paying attention to the transitions that are necessary yeah exactly. the, the in between yeah and yeah. so you end up with a jilted weird conversation that sort of yeah. ends up like getting three quarters of the information you know what that's like by the way just to give people an analogy if they if they could they could probably visualize this is like navy seals going from the water if we're inserting from the water and we're going to a target it's like me being in the water and the next thing I'm thinking is being on the target, and I'm, I'm completely missing that I have to come off the come up, come out of the water, transition to a, another set of gear, and keep on moving. Right, so yeah, yeah. it's that it's that bridge, and and the and the the key to success. So a CEO used to tell me, even in the military, in in, in these operations, in spec operations, the key to success is to understand and master the gaps. Right, mm-hmm. the transitions are the hardest part. Right, because yeah. because if you don't transition properly. It, you're, you're going to fail, right? The, the the stuff you do on the X, that's fine, right? The stuff you do over here, I can swim, I can dive, I can I can kick doors. The transitions are always going to be the hardest part. And I think the same thing in a sales conversation. Yeah, which is yeah. super interesting because like I teach people to have fallback positions to where they're comfortable. Yeah. So it's like if you're in this realm and you get lost, you go to this question. Yes. And yeah. this is the question that you can then, because you can go a little bit up and a little right, bit right. down. So you've got like a fallback position. And there's a series of like four or five questions in any PQ process oh. that gave me the ability to never have to... To, to re-anchor. To yeah, so I could just go, well, yeah, just yeah. so I can see the rationale behind why you might. And so, right, right. And, and I know those questions, like those are, I could, you could wake me up and I could be like, I just saw, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of, it's just yeah. drilled into you, right? And so it's important, like, like so whenever I'm teaching someone sales, like, um, the first thing I try and do is, like, understand their process and yeah. how they do it. If I'm working with them, like, individually, like a team, 
right? Because like the worst thing I can do is like, hey, you do it this way now. Yeah. Because even if it's a better way, it's not going to work very well because you suck at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, so it, it's like, how do we, how do we position some key points where we get key information very easily and conversationally? Yeah that gives that person the ability to just like rest and chill yeah. and, 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 intake the con- and intake the information easily. Yeah. Because people, like, I would say most sales end with the salesperson feeling awkward, not knowing what to say and booking a next call. Mm-hmm. And like they haven't got enough information to make that next call be worthwhile. So right. the person doesn't usually show up or they, they, they get sent a quote. Remember how, like, when you said, the, yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. you know, so yeah, for the yeah. backstory, so, like, you sent me a quote, and I was like, hey, you seem like someone who can take feedback, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> it, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like, this, this, is not, this is not a good way of doing this. <laughs> yeah. It's a great thing, but yeah, it's yeah. a very different, you know, like, an expert doesn't give, you know, like, a, a chef a, a chef doesn't allow you to remove the cardamom. Right, right. Yes. Right? Yeah. It, it, it's like, this is how right. I've made the broth. Right. Like, yeah, here's I'm, the broth. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm the chef, right. you know? And so, when you present, like, you present... Yeah. This is how you're going to do it. Right, right. If you can't afford it, that is not my problem. Right, right. Yeah. Right? Which is how I present like larger B2B sort of like high six and seven figure sales training packages yeah. for like large companies. I tell them like, mate, I'm the expert. Uh, your budget is not my concern. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like if, 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 if I'm not, I'm not going to try and work way out of your budget, but if you right. tell me your budget is $100,000 to train 400 people, yeah. I will say, uh, go over there. Right, right. Because might not be able to help you. how am I going to train that many people right. effectively? Right. For that much money, like the amount of resource that I need, I can't speak to 400 people on one Zoom call. Like it's not going to be productive. So I got to break everyone up into chunks. Then I got to do things differently. And it's yeah. like I want the new guys and the experienced guys. And you know what I mean. So yeah, you got to yeah, kind of yeah. do it properly. Sure. Um, and so I've the mentality that I've taken over the last six months has been like I will do, I will put together what I think will be the most effective for you and your team. If you can afford it, great. Yeah. If you can't, high five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like not yeah. my problem. Yeah. Um, which is probably a, a somewhat unique position to be in, which I understand, but it also, like, no one said no. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I've, and I've quadrupled people's budgets. Yeah. But it's just they go like, oh, yeah, that, w- that will work. Yeah. And I go, well, if it'll work, what do you think the outcome will be? And they go this, and I go, and it's just a math equation, isn't it? Right. I go, you want to make $10 million, it's going to cost you 400000 Right, right, yeah. And they go. Some of the attributes that, that I'm recognizing that are, that are essential for, for great sales are um, situation awareness, of course. You have to, be able oh, yeah. to, you have to, take, you have to take in. Um, compartmentalization in the sense that when you're listening, you're listening. You're focused in. Yeah. You have to focus and block out everything else and to include your own head. Um, task switching to a certain degree, that's going to be most salespeople have that. Um, but also the other one I would say is discernment. Discernment is one of the mental acuity ones where, where you actually, there's a, there's a recognition of detail uh, and refinement that you can actually present uh, that's unique to maybe a customer. So yeah. I'd have to look at the, the larger list, but I'm sure there's, there's yeah. more. But, uh, there, but yeah, There's actually two. It's actually fun, funny because there are two that on the extremes yeah. end up performing really well. Yeah. So insouciance, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Lack of, a lack of give a fuck. Right? Yeah, yeah. Casual, casual, uh, casual indifference to what other people think. Yeah, which I'm very high in. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is a great thing to have. But right. also, a crippling need to be accepted is also acceptable. Yeah, you, yeah. So both polarities work in other yeah, words. Yeah. But so the middle you, doesn't work. But the middle doesn't work. So, so 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 being high. So so insouciance is the is the high. And so high insouciance is a high ca- uh, lack of in, lack of. Uh, indifference to what people think. Low insouciance is basically fear of rejection, right? Is I, I really care what people think, and so I'm going to I'm going to model my behavior, I'm going to adjust my behavior so that I can actually do that. Which, be, be honest with you, may, Navy SEALs all have low insouciance, pretty much. All of us care deeply what other people think, or at least our teammates, right? We would yeah. rather die than look bad in front of our teammates, well, right? That's so, why they put yeah. cameras in war zones, right? <laughs> that's right, yeah. So. yeah. No one's a coward in front of a <laughs> Yeah, but, um, but I think that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating yeah. distinction. Is that I would you, say I used to be that way. Yeah. And then um, I actually had a realization, like I would say it was, it was years ago, where I realized that people will create the narrative that best suits their Them, worldview. Yes, yeah. And I, as soon as I realized that, I stopped giving any fucks about what people <laughs> yeah. thought because, like, I've never taken the low road, ever. Yeah. yeah. Never taken the low road. I've never fucked anyone over, mm-hmm. right? Um, I've always told the truth. Yeah. Um, I've never done a scumbaggy thing. And if it's in business or business partners or with friends or with anything, I've yeah. always been willing to be the one that takes the L personally in exchange for everybody getting a greater good. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and so, like, 
and I'm a good friend, a good father, a good husband. Yep. And so I was like, I sort of realized all these things, and I was like, I've never fucked a single person over, yeah. ever. Yeah. And like, I've fired people. And those people say I fucked them over, yeah. but I gave them seven warnings. Right, right, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And I was yeah. like, hey, man, like, I just can't keep you around. And then, but three months later, even if I go, but I'm going to pay you a month. Right. Right? There was a person recently, and I was like, I'm going to do all these things for you because I like you as a person, but I, we just can't have you there anymore. Right, right. Oh, thank you so much. And then a week later on social media, I'm a fuckwit. Right, right, right. And I was like, like, it doesn't hurt my feelings. I go, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I go, that's you know, and like my best friend is like, look at this fucking. Idiot. I'm like, and he, he knows I don't care. Well, so the question you is, because I feel the same way, and the, and the question is, how much of that comes also with just age and maturity? Oh, and tons I, of I, that. And, be, and like being a being a husband, being a father, you know, you know, you know, I, you're you're in your 40s, I think, right? Um, I'm, I'm just turning 40, and, I, and I'm I'm 50, right? So so we're at this we we and we've done a lot of shit in our lives, right? And so yeah. so as younger folks, just because we we're we're so malleable and 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 the world is is uh, we're, we're figuring it out. I think I think yeah. there's a higher sense, but but. But I actually I feel sorry for those people who who age and don't become more insouciant. Right? Yeah, it's a difficult uh, life. Yeah, it really is. And honestly, you know, you know, a great example of this is a lot of Hollywood, right? I mean, you think about a, an environment. I'm not, I don't know a lot of Hollywood people, but it seems like an environment where it's, it, you know, people really have to care what other people think for quite a long time. I mean, I think probably the older the older set of of actors, you know, you know the the. The high level, like Tom Hanks's and stuff, maybe don't have to anymore. But, uh, but I just, you know, sometimes environments, I guess, seed that type of behavior. I am grateful that as I've aged, my insouciance has gone up. Now, too much insouciance, and again, extremes at any level, bad thing, right? That's someone who 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 doesn't care so much that their 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 social awareness goes down, and they don't want to be. No one wants to be around them. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, and to so, be honest, I so think like I've, I actually came balance. pretty close to crossing that line yeah. a while ago, and. Um, I sort of like my wife is like you're being you're kind of a dick. Yeah. And I was like, huh? Yeah. And yeah, she's yeah. like, you're kind of a dick. And she's like, you're not mean, you're not anything like that. But she's like, you're kind of a dick. Like you just tell too much of the truth all the time. Right. You don't and have I a filter. Like, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, okay, I can I can work on that. Yeah. And I was like, tell me when I'm doing it. I have a trigger word. Right. Tell yeah, me when yeah, I'm doing yeah. it. Yeah. Like nudge me if I'm like being because I'm a very like. Uh, like I'm naturally a very dominating personality, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I like have to try very hard to not, yes, to not do that because yeah. one of the things that ADHD does or ADD is the way that ADD people show empathy is by having stories of them. So you know, like one uppers, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way that in, like usually like if someone like I have to hold myself back from from, from saying, oh, well, that happened to me too. Yeah, yeah oh, that's you know, right. Because yeah. that's how ADHD shows empathy. Interesting, right? Interesting. And so, yeah. like, so, but it, but it sounds, but, 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 but people you know, don't like, people don't like because it's, but what's happening is it's, you're not listening. You're basically you're yeah. you're immediately turning the conversation back to you. Yeah. Here's but it here's, is actually the ultimate listening let me, let for me, them. It's let, quite interesting. Yeah, it is. Let me let me yeah. highlight something that you said because it's really important. The fact that your wife told you, "Hey, you're being a dick." Okay, this is this really emphasizes the importance of great teams. Okay, because again, and a, and a team is any group of two or more people. You're on a team with your with your wife. I'm on a team with my wife. If we have the right teammates, okay, and we have teammates that that we trust, that love us, that give us candor with care, yeah. tell us when we're getting out over our skis, right? Yeah. That's what we need. Every every great team inside of itself keeps itself accountable, right? By 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 grounding each other, right? And so my wife's done that for me for 23 years, and I do it for her on occasion, right? And I'm sure you do it for your wife as well. But yeah. we have a relationship where we can tell each other exactly what's going on. Hey. Stop it. You're being an idiot. You're being an asshole, yeah. right? Okay, yes, God. And we listen, right? Because there's a mutual respect. So, yeah. so, so, but this doesn't go for just our marriages. I mean, we, you and I are lucky. We found, we found, we found women that we, that yeah. we, we get along with quite a bit, or, you know, yeah. quite well, right? But this goes for business teams too. When you're building a team, you want to build a team of people who ground each other. It happened for you in the military. It happened for me in the military where, where we, now we, the environment helped ground us too. But, um, you know, because the ocean will kill you if you turn your back on it. But, um, but we had we had a situation where even as an officer in charge, my most junior enlisted could say, "Hey, boss, you know that what you're doing there is fucked up." And I'm like, "Got it, right?" It, it's just, you know because because we need to keep each other grounded. So, so I, think, I think also like the selection and the difficulty that you've all had to go through. There's such a level of mutual respect that right. like yeah. you're all men, yeah. you're all there, you can yeah. all do the thing, and rank is a thing that we all have to deal with. Yes. Right, yes. like, I, like I remember, I had a had a like sort of a very bad relationship with uh, someone who outranked me. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. and I was I was a digger. Like everyone outranked me. Yeah, right, because yeah. <laughs> like the the pathway that I went down, like there was no promotions. It was just that's yeah. the job, right. and that's not a. There's not many people doing the job, yeah, yeah. 
you're not going anywhere. That's the job. That's right. Yeah. That's the job. There you go. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. If someone dies, you might be able to go up. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and, and so, like, I remember he, he was sort of like hooking into me, and I was like, he's a pretty small guy. Mm-hmm. I was pretty confident I would beat the fuck out of him if I needed to. <laughs> and I was like, uh, hey, man, um, rank is a thing, and I'll do whatever you say. But I feel like we should probably just drop rank, go outside, beat the shit out of each other for a bit, and then come back in and I'll do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I feel like that would be that would probably end the tension yeah, because at the end of the day, yeah. like we are dudes, we are just guys. Right, right, yeah, we're, yeah. Did it work? You guys could do it. Go on. Um, he really didn't want to. Yeah, yeah. He he much preferred to to do things the way sure, that he yeah. could just yell at me. And, <laughs> yeah. So I was shit jobs for a few months, but that's all right. So you're I remember not gonna, you're not going to volunteer for a fight, you know you'll lose. Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I remember um, I remember we were doing all these exercises. Um, uh, with the cops and, do, and do, so, like just stuff like that, and it was like we we're doing hides, and it was like, oh uh, yeah, you guys are in the Marriott suite over there, you guys are over here, and then like Matt, you're, and I was like, let me guess, underneath the porta potty? Yes. <laughs> and they were like, exactly, and yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, yeah that's right, <laughs> I'd be yeah. A, like shit jobs, but it's all right. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's it, it, it's an interesting thing, but I think like the when you start, it, it's so interesting, especially when you start learning about the world of attributes and like, it's sort of like a, oh, it, you know, like a glass shattering moment where yes. you realize something about something and you go, oh, and you start to kind of see it yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, exactly what you said. It, it sort of informs your behavior. But mm-hmm. look, in, I think from a, like when you're building a team point of view, if, if you can accurately assess yourself, yes, then you can build a team. Because what you don't want is a team of like, I don't want... I don't want any more me's in the business. Right. That would be a right. problem. Yeah. Right? Uh, balanced. But, exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. one other me, uh, um, but he's very young. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you might have met him, Yash, right? Yeah, I remember, yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Yash, and I haven't decided whether or not he'll be my Luke or my Anakin, right? He's, he's, he's either going <laughs> to... Yeah, that's I right. Haven't, I haven't yeah. figured out yet whether yeah, yeah. he's going to be the Sweet. best thing ever for the rest of my life or whether he's going to try and It'll kill me. It'll be a Sith relationship or a Jedi relationship. Yeah, right? so he's, he's, oh, either, he's either the villain of my story or the yeah. hero of my story. I don't know which one, but we have a really good relationship. But he's, he's very young, and so, but he's, he's the most similar in terms of, you know, the way that he operates and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, um, but, but I think, like, being able to, to have a look at your, like, like, a business partnership, like, you have a look at me, Jeremy, and Marco, like, yeah. we're very, very yeah. different people. Yeah. I think that we, in, in, in quite, a, quite a good way, fill in the gaps that we all yeah, have, yeah, because, yeah. like, I'm, in the, le- the things that I have, I'm fairly high in, yeah. you know what I mean, like, for most of the time, and so, like, I'm sort of a personality that people really like or right. really don't like. Right. Like, yeah. I've always been that way. And I've been pretty cool with it. Like, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is what it is. It's fine. Um, and so, like, I think that finding people who can round you out, and that was the most interesting part about what I thought about talking to you, mm-hmm. was I think that my perception was incorrect because I think, like, what I was trying to create was, like, the dream team. Mm-hmm. But the dream team, I created what I thought was the dream team, and it fucking didn't, it didn't work, work at all. Right, yeah. Because, like, there were so many chiefs. yes. And so many cooks trying to cook that yeah. broth that it was an absolute fucking shit show. Yep. And although everybody knew that I was the leader, it did, yeah, they still like. Well, so let me give you this because I think this is, and we've talked about this too. But uh, but the, the leadership model, a lot of people are, they don't know exactly what the high performing team leadership model looks like. And I didn't either. Um, I was, I, I kind of, it I, it hit me when I was in front of a group of executives at one point after getting out of the navy, and I, w- I was talking to them, and I had a uh, a white a, a whiteboard next to me or a flip chart and they said hey rich could you draw for us what the task org shape looks like for a high performance team right so like, what does that look like and, and and so i had some models that I, I had some models in my head that didn't work i didn't know what i was gonna draw but you know I, obviously there's the pyramid model right the leader sits on top i'm the leader you work for me all the all the word goes down to the bottom and it has to go all the way back to the, the very hierarchical very bureaucratic very military in some cases but way too slow for a high performing team so i wasn't gonna use that I had the flat model, which is the flat line, okay? And that was, that was a kind of mild rebellion to the pyramid. It's like flatten this thing. No one outranks anybody. We're all in this Men together. Yeah, like, hey, we'll just, nothing ever gets yeah, done. Now, now, the problem is, it's not too bad. The problem is, first of all, sometimes it's difficult to figure out actually who's in charge. And second of all, what happens with the flat model, the flat line, is that something can happen on the right side of the line that's not seen or heard by the left. The information gets siloed. That's not what happens on a high-performing team. Information is everywhere. So the third model is the, was the uh, Robert Greenleaf servant leadership model. He turned that pyramid upside down. Leader sits on bottom. I'm your leader. I'm in service to everybody in my span of care. 
not too bad. In fact, if I were to philosophically pick any one of them, it'd be that one because it's, it's probably the most beautiful, at least philosophically. However, it's still not the way a high-performing team operates because in a high-performing team, burden is distributed. So what I did kind of in frustration on the board is I just drew a blob on the board. And I said to the group, I said, where do you think the leader sits in this blob? And they said, you know, top, bottom, front, front, back, center. I said, all of you are correct. Okay. In this blob, the leader is wherever the leader needs to be in the moment. And this is a concept I call dynamic subordination. And dynamic subordination implies that a team understands that problems, challenges, and issues can come from any angle at any moment. And when one does, the person who's closest to that problem, the most capable, immediately steps up and takes lead. Mm. And everybody follows. And then the environment shifts and someone else. I also call it alpha hopping, right? The alpha position just hops. This is exactly how the highest performance. How hard that is to do in business. Like I know, however, but one of the keys to it, and by the way, you know, I, I, I was an officer. Yeah, it yeah. makes total sense. And I was an officer in the SEAL team. I was in charge of every single operation I went on. Didn't mean I was always being supported. In fact, most of the time it was the opposite. I was supporting other people, snipers, breachers, whatever, right? Sometimes the environment would shift and they'd support me. But, but the idea is to build a dynamically subordinating environment, you need to have team members with attributes that start to zipper together. So take a two-person team, my wife and I, okay? I am very high on patience as a human being, okay? Mm-hmm. My wife is very low on patience, or in other words, high on impatience, okay? That's worked beautifully in our relationship, okay? Because when patience has been required, I step up. When impatience is required, she steps up. And so, so my patient, or her impatience has helped me, or helped, uh, helped buttress my procrastination, moving too slow. My patience has helped her not run into the building too fast, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and so when we create teams, just like you're saying, when you have a triad where, where the attributes start to mesh like zippers, right? this is what you're looking for. And you can't get that if you have a bunch of the same people. Attributes allow you to break that stuff down so you can start actually picking the people who zipper in together and building the best teams that dynamically subordinate all the time. So you can do it in business, but you just have to understand what qualities you're looking for so you can actually zipper them together. It's fascinating. I, we- we actually had a me and uh, me and, me and my best mate Pat and and, and Ben who like works here as well. We've been our best friends for a very long time. We actually we're uh, once a year we go onto the farm, right? We do a bit of hunting, yeah. light a bonfire, you know, drink some booze, just stuff. and just yeah. sit there staring at a fire in yeah. silence. And every now and then, laugh our asses off, right? Yeah. Um, and so and we've been friends. All of us have been friends for a very long time. Yeah. Like you know, we, we got a group of probably ten people that has been very close friends for. Uh, decades now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is very rare. Yes. And especially amongst like operators, because what usually happens is you get together and you sort of leave yeah, yeah. like that. And we, we've sort of discussed as to why it is. And we, I think we figured out what it is, is because we have exactly that. Yeah. So there are instances. So first of all, none of us, none of us particularly care about offering anybody else. Yes. Like that's not any of our MOs. Like right. we don't need to be the leader at all times. Right. And we all know that we're very good at independently at different things. Mm-hmm. Like one of our friends, if there's an apocalypse, he will be the immediate leader. Everybody's going to him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. He, immediate leader, Tim. Yeah. Right? Know. Everyone knows apocalypse, Tim. Right? Yeah. What, what are we doing, boss? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah. If it's like a money or business thing, they will immediately come to me. Yeah. Right? Uh, and, and everyone has, has their, their own yeah. little uh, skill sets. Yeah. And, and so it dynamically floats, yeah. and everyone is okay with everybody else holding the mantle. Yes. Right? If there's a story to be told in a public in- environment, like, we would default to Pat. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. he would be the one to he tell it because he's the most engaging, the most charismatic in that way. And, right. you know, he's the best at creating stories, whether they be true or not. Yeah. They're always very entertaining. Never let right? the truth get in the way exactly. of the story. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Um, and, and so, like, it's it's quite funny. And so we sort of figured out that, like, we're, we just do that naturally as a group. Yeah. And that's why, like, there's never any – we don't argue. There's never any tension. Right. But we can have very serious conversations. Like, one of my friends recently um, was getting divorced. And he was sort of, hey, man, just go have a coffee. We'll talk about it. And he started saying some stuff. And I said, hey, man, do you, do you want the supportive friend conversation or do you want, like, the feedback conversation? Yeah, 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 He's the yeah. feedback. And I was like, all right, motherfucker. <laughs> like that. And, like, I went in and hammered him. And yeah. I was like, you know, like, it comes from a place of love. And I was like, I was like does that make sense? And he was like, yeah. So they, so by the way, let me pause there because that's the other thing that happens when you have a trusted dynamic. Instant support. feedback. And, but it's, but it's, but you can you can give that hard feedback, and someone knows it's coming from a place of love, right? Yeah. If you try to do that and you haven't built the trust first, people are going to feel like you're just being an asshole, right? And yeah. so you have to build trust first. If you're building a business team, okay, build trust first yeah. before you start giving that candorous feedback because if they don't know it, uh, if they don't th- if they don't think and trust you and think it's coming from a place of good, they'll just think you're an asshole. So. Yeah, and that's that's anyway. that, that's my sort of biggest issue is yeah. because like I'll go because you go in you go in hard right away. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I try not to, but yeah. like I just also like there's no in my opinion there's no point like 
you can do it respectfully. Yeah. But it's like there's no point in mincing this. Like let's yeah. just call it out because the faster we all realize it, yeah. the faster we can create. And I think one of the issues is a lot of people think that like think that someone is upset when they're giving like That's feedback. Right. Yes, you're absolutely it's right. It's not yeah. upset. Yeah. It's like yeah. no no no. Like it's I actually care about you getting yeah. the right outcome. Yeah. That's why I'm giving this. Well, so 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 great example. Now I'm used to. I came from a world from feedback, right? So when you wrote me that email and you're like, "Hey, I, I, I want to give you some feedback, right?" And you just said, "Hey, this is the wrong thing to do. This is not what." Um, first of all, I was like, okay, "That's cool." I was like, thank, thank, "Thanks for the feedback, right?" But the other thing that you do, what I noticed and stuff, since I've known is you, you you always follow that up with kindness, right? And you and I think I think if someone is is willing enough to stay around you, you will follow it up. You'll show them, hey, I'm doing this because I care. And I think that's, you can, you can, you can um, earmark or at least sandwich that type, of, that type of candor as long as you're showing that caring. You're, 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 you're displaying it. You're displaying it. Because then someone gets that, they're like, okay, wait a second. It, he wasn't mad. He, he cares about me, really. It's not, it's just, it's, it's just him. And then they begin to appreciate it. So I would actually imagine those who stick around you trust you faster than normal people because you are immediately giving them feedback. And it's, you're following up, hey, I'm doing this because I really care. I really do, you know. And so, yeah. so, but that's a difficult, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult balance to, or a tightrope to walk. You, yeah. you've, you've walked it your whole life, so you're good at it. Um, if you're coming into a team, the idea is try to build trust first yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's a better default, right? It's a safer default if you can yeah. do that, yeah. So what's a good company or, or, or what's, what's a good avatar of someone who should seek someone like you out or you out specifically? Yeah, the, uh, the, if, you, if you are interested in, A, um, understanding the performance of your organization. What drives your organization at very elemental levels? What, what does that What does that look like? What are the qualities that go into your top performance? If you were to If you were to look at your top performers or the time you've been times you've been t- performing at your top levels, what are the things that allowed that to d- to happen? What are the qualities that allow that to happen? Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in figuring what that out, what that list is, like, you know, for your top organization, and if you're interested in organizing your team, one reorganizing your team so that you actually put people in the right positions, right? Part of what sometimes happens is people's individual attributes don't match the position they're in, and so they're performing at a low level. And what and and what what they really need is they just need a different position. So, quick example: I was commanding officer of one of the squadrons at this command we were talking about. And when I was commanding officer, I had a supply a supply cell. Right, my supply cell was about eight people, well, half of which were doing future acquisitions and future look. The other half were doing um, administrative log keeping type stuff. We had a, a, a sailor who was grossly underperforming in the future acquisitions piece, and she was just she was just not performing. It was bringing down morale. I brought her to my office. I'd already done the attributes work because I'd already been training officer, and so I had about a ten minute conversation. And in about ten minutes, I realized that her attribute list was completely incongruent with what she was doing, but it was completely congruent with the administrative lo- log keeping side. So all I did was shift her. Right, just shifted positions. Her performance skyrocketed. Right, she was on the she was in the wrong position. So, so by understanding these elemental factors, you can in fact replace sometimes people or or, or reposition people mm-hmm. rather than just firing. Okay, yeah. then of course you're going to have some gaps. Okay, um, do you want to be able to fill those gaps with the right person the first time every time? Right, we've worked with organizations who have literally come to us and they have a uh, two out of ten success rate in hiring, and then they do the work with us, and they find out the qualities. They realize, holy shit, we were looking for the wrong things. We tweak their their selection process so they're actually seeing the attributes, and it's t- changed it into an eight out of ten mm-hmm. uh, uh, success process. So imagine how much money that saves. I mean, you're talking about the hiring process alone. Yeah. The money you spend bringing candidates in, hiring someone, paying them for three months or four months. Or yeah, it's hectic. And firing them and all that. So if you're interested in taking down those costs and hiring the you know hiring the right people at the right time. We can help you with that, all right? So, so this this idea of understanding the culture of your organization at very elemental levels and placing and hiring people and positioning people directly in line with that culture, and the collateral of that is yes, it will also allow you to fire more effectively as well. I mean, yeah. one of the things I would honestly, this was created from the firing aspect at at, at the well, command. Speed to fire is an important element. Yeah, and the command said we we need you to be able to articulate to guys who aren't making it. Why they aren't making it, right? And otherwise, so, you just breed resentment. Otherwise, you breed resentment, which we were at that, at that time. So, so you will be able to literally fire more effectively, more, um, more considerately, um, and and with more with more um, 
uh, with more understanding and depth, both from the from the person who's uh, who's the recipient of the of the firing and yourself, and that's just to make everybody feel better. Um, and so, so I think all of those things are reasons why this stuff could be for you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for like, so what we did is we went through, we had a chat, and from there. We did a we did a values assessment, so we, we had we had our values and mission yeah, and vision all yeah. kind of worked out, and then from there, sort of you know, it, the interesting thing that actually was like we we don't want a gr- a room of just the leadership team. No, yeah, it's not just was leadership. was having, and I actually think that like having me in there might have actually been less productive. Well, I, I would have told you if it had been you 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 didn't talk as much as you as you I tried to very yeah, much. Yeah. So, uh, but it's always good, and I, I you know I can read rooms now because I've done this a lot. And yeah. people, I no one was really I didn't feel like anybody was holding back. We had very good yeah. participation from everybody in that room. So yeah, yeah. We, and then it was interesting because we had like a new EA. Yes, we had yeah. you know uh, uh, myself. Um, we had uh, we didn't have Marco because like he was well he was on he was online remember yeah he was online then we had new people experienced people and like people from all different departments yeah. and because it was like how do we you want a good you want a good cross section yeah you want a cross section of an organization uh, and and the criteria is the cross section of people who a are invested in the company right yeah. they, they 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 really they really enjoy it they understand it to a to a to a degree even if if even if it's in their own circle and they're interested in this type of yeah and it's also like diversity of thought. That's yes, really what you're looking for, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so having people of different, yeah. you know, different uh, different thought patterns, you yeah. know? Well, it's funny because you and I, when we first started talking, you and I started doing it just together. I remember we were, just, we were on a couple of calls. We were like, hey, let's just start working on this side. And we were like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. We should probably get some more people in here. Yeah, yeah. Because, because it would have been polluted, right? It was just been yeah. one from one mind, and we don't want that. Yeah, and I just, yeah, I didn't, because I remember I've done a, a, a planning session before where we tried to figure some stuff out, and it was just like, the moment I said something, yeah. it was like, well, that's what it is. And so yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I really sort of wanted to make sure that we didn't pollute that so that we could get to the crux of like, it's actually very interesting to see what people thought yes. were important because I didn't agree with everything, yeah. but I understood it. Yeah. And I was like, huh, yeah. that's interesting. Like, what are they seeing? Yes. And so I was able to kind of look into different departments and go like... Which, by the way, is the job of leaders, right? As leaders, yeah. our whole job is to have the big picture. And if we are deliberately ignoring the perspectives of some of the people on our team, yeah. we're doing wrong by them and by the team. And, and, if, you, and if you're designing a, a sales department and a marketing department, for example, with the same sort of mission, vision, values, yeah. and like you're using skill sets, like they're going to be really odd because like, especially if you have a single hiring Yes. Like, because usually you have a single hiring mechanism, right? right. So you have like HR yeah, operations yeah, yeah. doing the hiring and then segmenting out. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, one of the things we do, as you know, really is good. is we we provide HR departments with the information that allows their hiring practices to diversify responsibly. So in other words, the way that they're going to ask questions for one type of candidate will differ slightly than the way they're going to ask questions yeah. for another because it's going to be focused on these attributes. And you, ask, yeah. you can ask questions in a way that are teasing out specific attributes. And so it provides HR departments with a myriad of yeah. different ways they can hire different positions. And that's and done like it's, by the people in the department. It's, it's created by the people there. Yeah, because like, I just like, you know, I didn't realize that there was such a difference in personality and requirement yeah. from sales to HR to ops to yeah. to admin to admin. CEO. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and also and like you know the, the executive function is super funny yes. because like you know um, like there's a like to be the CEO of a company like you have to have a very particular personality typing which 100%. doesn't mean you're necessarily the best at everything yeah. like that's probably not great. Yeah, no, I don't think it is. You yeah, know? and and so um, because if you're like. You know, so like I'm not the best salesperson yeah. in the company. Like Jeremy right. definitely is. Like yeah. I'm not the best marketer by country mile. The only time that actually, the only time that it, it it's not bad, right? And this is a, is a really good example is in a, in the brand new startup. I mean, the yeah. the the exact team in a startup, the attributes required to do a startup are actually a different. The, 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 that li- looks di- that list looks different than the than the company that has to keep going that they'll go along. So which is this why is why you see startups if they go a few years and they don't turn over their leadership a little bit, they'll tend to start a downslide. One hundred percent because that the, the attributes don't fit anymore. Now we're yeah. we're, we're playing. Well, you've long got game. builders, right? Yeah. So yeah. like I we had to work pretty hard because I recognized that and I was very entrepreneurial yeah. and I still am. However, I really had to kind of make a transition yeah. into more of a executive, more of a. Uh, long game, more, yeah. more of a long game thinking, yeah. and it, like I, it, I think it worked. Like I, yeah. like I, I like it. You're you're able to do that. The serial entrepreneur can't, and that's why the serial entrepreneur will come in. They'll start something, 
And then after a couple of years, they have to exit and they have to go start something else. Yeah, there's a lot of shiny things. Yes. You know what I mean? And and so, um, but yeah, it's 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 a, it's very interesting. Like, see, you know, um, CEO is a really terrible position. Well, it is. I mean, it's it's a very hard position. People don't, people don't understand. When done correctly, it's a it's an enormously difficult job, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, when done correctly, because it's very lonely. Yeah. Because like you you have to be the one that it's kind of like the like the no guy. Yeah. Or like the hard guy, and um, you you cannot, you 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 don't have anyone, and you know it from the teams, right? Yeah. Like you don't. There's no one that. There's you no can peers go that you can go to. Yeah. That's yeah, right. and so that's the difficulty of the position, and also like if you're someone who has to be busy, yeah, you will not be a good CEO. Oh yeah, it's true. Like you yeah. you cannot. You have to let go. Yeah, you okay. have to you have to and you have to watch people make mistakes. Yes. Which is the most interesting and interesting. Well, here's the, here's the example. Anybody who has kids will understand this, and you understand this, I know. Um, being a CEO is like being a, a parent, right? And and being a parent is all about allowing your child, as hard as it is, to make mistakes, yeah. right? If we don't, if we if we just create a shield around our kids, they are going to learn nothing. They're going to be they're going to be weak, and they're going to they're going they're never going to leave the nest. Or when they do, they'll die as soon as they leave, right? So yeah. so the act of literally letting go of your child as they're learning to ride the bike. Knowing they're going to fall down is one of the scariest acts of a parent. But we have to do it because we're letting them go. We have to let them take their falls. Yeah. Same thing goes as a CEO. It yeah. absolutely goes. We are, we are, because if we don't do that, we are not creating a team that can act dynamically and dynamically subordinate. Yeah. We're, we're not and you've got to take a few L's when you're doing that. Like I remember yes. over the last yeah. year, uh, we had a few things happen in like the end of Q3, and I was like, oh, that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah. but if I fix this, I was like, this is just going to yeah, keep happening. Keep happening. And yeah. so, like, I, I, I said, hey, guys, I think this is happening. I was like, but I trust you. Yeah, yeah. And so I watched. I, I watched from afar, but yeah. I was, I knew what was happening. And I, and I sort of was, I put the bumper lanes up a little yes, bit. And yes, I was like, yeah. da-da, da-da, like right. that. But I let them make the mistakes. So, so here's a here's a here's an Navy SEAL example of that. All right, was a, was is interesting. Um, so one of our missions at this command was we had to basically uh, be able to drop into any environment with our speedboat, with our big, big. Uh, 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 no, they're basically uh, H sacks. They're like they're oh, like yeah. super super fast. They look like the cigarette boats basically. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and we had we had a couple of these, and we'd have a couple of them in each airplane. So we'd have about four. And the, the evolution was basically you're you're flying at at about twenty five hundred feet, three thousand feet. Uh, the boats will go out right, and they're under parachute. And then the, and the guys who are driving the boats, they'll go right after the boats. Okay, um, and then they'll, they'll the boats will drop. The guys will get on the boats. They'll derig them. They get them all all running. They'll, they'll line the boats up into the wind while the plane's circling. And once the boats are lined up in the wind, then the rest of us will jump out and, and basically jump to our boats. Okay. So anyway, this, this is our, 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 our standard thing. We're, we're off. We're in Virginia, right, practicing. It's a daytime. It's, it's, it's July, right, in the middle of the day. We're out off the coast doing this. And my jump master, who for the audience, uh, you know, that's the guy who's in charge of the whole jump. He's yeah. going to be spotting. The, he's going to say, hey, this is when you go, right? Yeah. He's, it's, his, it's his first... It's his first oh, yeah. drop, right? Um, and so we, we're out there. He, he drops the boats. That's usually the easy drop because you're just dropping. There's no real DZ. You're just dropping in the water. The harder drop comes when the boats are lined up because now you've got to get the guys spotted. Oh, I was like, I was going to fuck a lot. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, so anyway, we're, so the boats are out. They're getting set Are you on roundies or are you on squarries? Oh, no, we're on squarries. Yeah, yeah. We, we're jumping out basically counting to four and pulling. You know? yeah. so, um, because we have to drive. We have to fly to our boats. We want to land kind of precise. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we're the boats are out. They're getting set up, and I'm and now we're just in the plane waiting. And and my and the ramp's open, right? So I'm just kind of walking back to my jump master's out there. He's looking, and it's and I know we're we're getting close to drop time. I'm looking, and I'm like, hmm, this doesn't really look right. Right? It looks like we're looks like we're off, right? And at that point, I have to make a decision. I'm the commanding officer, right? I have to make a decision, and my decision is gauged with this thought process. Okay, I said, listen, I need him to. Learn and understand. Okay. Mistakes are a great way. To let, me, let me. Mistakes are a great way to go. Let me just assess risk for a second. It's daytime, Virginia, right? Off the coast, the water's eighty degrees. We can all swim, right? None of us are bad swimmers, you know. You know, it's a soft landing. It's water. Right? Yeah. So you got RFDs anyway. Let, let, let me just. Let me just. Let, let's just see how this plays out, right? So I, I say nothing, okay? And so ultimately, he drops us. We come out of the the airplane, and the boats are fucking like. <laughs> and they have to turn. They're just. They're, and we're just. We create a swimmer pool, and they they drive to us, right? And so we drive to us. We go back. We're doing the the debriefs like we always do. They're always a heavy debriefs, and of course, he's just like he he's the hardest on himself, right? Because he knows he fucked up and all that stuff. And so we do all that stuff. And of course, I'm the commanding officer, so I get the last. Word. And I say, listen, if we had gone out there and everything had gone right, 
we would have learned nothing, right? Yeah. So we just learned a shit ton of stuff. Well, yeah. the next time we dropped, okay, it was a real world drop, okay, a real world, and he was our jump master. The guys who were on that drop have never seen a better drop, right? He, he nailed it, right? And the idea is, as leaders, as CEOs, as parents, we have to constantly let our people make mistakes, yeah. but we're always gauging risk, right? I'm not going to, had it been nighttime, for example, cold yeah. water, things, I may, have, I may have said something. I may have said, you know what, let me get one of my more experienced, just take a look at that before we, before we drop, right? I might have made a different decision because I am gauging risk to a certain yeah. degree. You're not going to let the company tank, right? No, exactly. Yeah, but you're going to say, okay, let me gauge risk, but, but to the extent that we can let people trip up, we want to let them, because here's the, here's the neuro, let me give you the neuroscience behind this. You know, Huberman and I talk about this. Um, there's a reason why we learn more with our mistakes than when, with, with, our, with our celebrations or our successes. And it's because when we learn, when we, when we learn anything, we create a neural connection, okay? And then neural connection is created, and then, and then if it's a skill, for example, what happens is we do that over and over, and it myelinates. That connection myelinates, right? Okay. So it's like, a co- it's like the, the wrapping around a coaxial cable. When that, when that wrapping is thin, that, that, um, that energy is going pretty slow. In other words, we have to think about it. So this is like driving the stick shift car for the very first time. You have to think about what you're doing. As you do it more and more and myelinates, you start being able to do it without thinking. That's okay. the way connections are made. Right? The most rapid way to create a neural connection and myelinate it, like 10 times, sometimes 100 times faster, is when three things are present in the environment. Those three things are intensity, novelty, and focus. Okay? If those three things are present, you actually create neural connections and myelinate it rapidly. In, in other words, you forge information. Okay? This is the difference between being told a stove is hot and touching a hot stove. Core memory. Okay. Yeah. When, you t- when you touch a hot stove, intensity novel, I mean, it's immediate, right? Our mistakes teach us more because when we make mistakes, those two things, intensity, novelty, or focus, are immediately present, and yeah. we're learning. Not the same with successes, right? So, so this is the power of making mistakes, right? We're, we're implementing neurological processes that are forging lessons in faster, as long as we're assessing risk, because that's our job as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Awesome, man. Yeah, good. that was good. If you guys want to find out riches, was the as the attributes dot com? The at the the attributes dot com, all one word. Yeah. And okay. Check it out. And what about socials? Are you? Yeah, uh, Rich Divini on uh, Instagram at Rich Divini, um, and um, and LinkedIn as well. Yeah. So all right. Check us out. Take the assessment. Read the book. Sounds good. All right, guys. Thanks very much. We'll see you in the next episode.